along with news click uh, uh, the constitution conduct group is a other collaborator in this uh, in this series uh, it, the constitution Con conduct group is is a is, is a really fine group of uh, former civil servants of which two members are here in the panel uh, sujata and keshav uh, ramani will say a brief welcome uh, on behalf of the constitution conduct group ramani hi everyone i am uh, ramani uh, i am a member of the constitutional conduct group and uh, the constitutional conduct group was formed about 3 years back because uh, a number of former civil servants felt that there had been and has been a steady erosion of constitutional values over the past many years uh, amplified in the past few years the group today has about uh, has exactly 173 members we have issued over the past 3 years 26 letters and four uh, organized four conclaves as well the idea being to bring to the notice of those in power are increasing discontent at the type of uh, sort of situations that are coming about in the country we have also had deliberations with constitutional bodies like the election commission to bring about electoral reforms not with too much success uh, as far as the current webinar series is concerned constitutional conduct group is very happy to be associated with this series because it has great topical relevance and it is of course a matter of life and death literally for everyone on the globe today uh, there are four areas i feel that uh, the constitutional conduct group is concerned with and uh, i'm sure the webinar series over time will be touching on easily each of these areas the first of course is the most important one that we are taking up today the related to health and uh, it is a fact that even 7 weeks after the lockdown started we don't see to be seeing any light at the end of the tunnel so obviously we need to pause and uh, sort of reassess what exactly has gone wrong with the strategy the second is the very critical issue of livelihoods and uh, we have seen the heart rending scenes of whatever has gone on over the past month and a half uh, both in terms of migrant labor as well as disadvantaged sections of the population all over the country in slums and in villages the third is i think something that we need to take up over time that is the dignity of the individual and issues relating to liberty and i think this is going to get more and more critical over time three areas suggest themselves immediately one we are already seeing that is related to the movement of migrant labor from where they are currently located to their villages and to their uh, home towns the second has been the issue of labor laws which again we find are becoming more and more restrictive the intention being obviously to give a sort of uh, a sort of uh, completely ignore labor rights working class rights in order to ensure that uh, production goes on stream which seems to be the only concern and the third is the issue of surveillance which i think is going to assume increasing importance in times to come the fourth issue is one which is i think critical which has not been touched adequately which is related to cooperative federalism although the state governments are tasked with the job of uh, tackling the pandemic there has been no real uh, involvement with them in terms of making finances available to them listening to them in terms of the strategies they wish to adopt there has been a one size fits all type of approach from above and i think this is again an issue which need to be discussed in far greater detail if we need to come out with this pandemic i think the issues we discuss today and in the coming series cover both the covid as well as the post covid era and we need to look at issues that are going to affect us even when we seem to have the pandemic under control because i think a number of these issues are going to remain with us and these are going to apply across geographies so we are not going to be um, Uh, sort of insulated from the impact of other countries what happens elsewhere i'm really grateful to ramni for having laid out uh, uh you know very richly uh, uh, you know the context not just of uh, of this particular discussion but of the entire i think the, the issues are so important that we'll probably have them every few days uh, very quickly back to back uh, to be able to bring together uh, thinking on how uh, how the government uh, are and should be responding uh, from the perspective of people who are most disadvantaged 
b- b- finally, before launching into the discussion, I invite my very uh, dear uh, uh, colleague from uh, who volunteers uh, leads the media and communication work in the Karwa, uh, a very fine uh, filmmaker and writer, Natasha Badwa, to uh, kindly introduce the panelists uh, and, and then we uh, dive in. Hello, everybody. Um, all speakers today are outstanding examples of public health professionals or administrators who have worked for equitable and just health systems in various ways. And it's really our privilege to have all of you together at the same time. Uh, Vikram Seth, psychiatrist and researcher, is the Pershing Square Professor of Go- Global Health in the Blavatnik Institute's Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at the Harvard Medical School. Keshav Desi Raju is an distinguished, has a distinguished career as an IS officer, crowned by his memorable term as Secretary Health, Government of India. He's chairperson of the Population Foundation of India and on the boards of CES, as well as Banyan Chennai. He's worked with homeless women uh, with mental health challenges. Sujata Rao, equally distinguished former civil servant and also former Secretary Health, Government of India, is a feisty and outspoken commentator on public health issues. Her many contributions include the first ever national program for non-communicable disease and a national policy for the use of antibiotics. Vandana Prasad is a community pediatrician and public health specialist, founder secretary of the Public Health Resource Network, PHRN, and joint convener of the Jan Swastian. based management of malnutrition and also advises CEA time to time with the homeless. Sujata is a noted people science leader. He has led the State Health Resource Center in Chhattisgarh for 10 years and as director of the Public Health National Resource Center, so being the Department of Public Health at TIS. Vikas Bajpai is a leading public health scholar and a voice for equity in the Center for Social Medicine, JNU. With this, I welcome all of you to start the discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Natasha. And uh, once again, I think uh, I'm extremely grateful that all of you have gathered. I think it's a token of how much we are concerned uh, about uh, which direction uh, as uh, you know as a concern of as Brahmi said a literal question of life and death for millions of people in India and around the world the choices that we make and uh, our, our officials make um, I wanted to underline right at the very beginning that this entire discussion and in fact the entire series is a series uh, of discussions which are primarily and and very avowedly partisan partisan in in the sense that these are on the side of people who are most disadvantaged so everything that we want we are discussing uh, more or less is is following uh, perhaps the talisman that mahatma gandhi had left for us a few months before he was assassinated when you are in confusion and doubt remember the most vulnerable person uh, uh, the weakest, uh, the most disadvantaged person that you know, uh, and and think whether what we are doing is making sense to her. Uh, and I think that that is primarily what we are trying to do in this discussion and in, in everyone that follows. Is it making sense to that most vulnerable person? And, and, and I wanted to also say that disadvantages of many kinds uh, in the context of the urban poor, even more more sharply, but I think also with the rural poor, we could look at disadvantage in in, in at least three kinds of axes. The first is, uh, you know, uh, the disadvan- economic disadvantage, disadvantage of of livelihood uh, and income. So people whose employment is, you know, who are uh, you know, have uncertain employment have. Uh, uh, are, are, are paid very low wages, uh, work in unsafe conditions, have no security, uh, etc. So I think that's one kind of uh, disadvantage. 
Uh, very importantly, there's a second axis of disadvantage, uh, and that is of, 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 of the kind of habitation uh, that you live in. So homeless people, people living in shanties, living in, uh, you know, uh, uh, under plastic sheets, etc. It's important to remember them because when, uh, when the whole prescription is around uh, social distancing and, uh, and washing your hands regularly, I mean, it's just so extraordinary that we keep talking about it to a people who live, uh, you know, perhaps uh, in, in, a, in a six, 10 people in a uh, six by eight or 10 by 10 shanty and you're asking them to spend 40 days cooped up uh, in that space uh, and uh, and to wash your hands when you uh, when 150 people share a common uh, toilet so so you're, you're, you're uh, you can be occupationally and economically disadvantaged you can be disadvantaged in relation to your living conditions and there's a third axis of disadvantage that I request this entire conversation and series to bear in mind, which is social disadvantage. So uh, disadvantage, uh, you know, as uh, a, a single woman headed household, uh, uh, children without care, people of Dalit and Adivasi communities, Muslim communities, which are particularly uh, targeted today. Uh, so uh, social disadvantages of age, of gender, of sexuality, uh, and so on. Uh, and and very often, very sadly, all of these three kinds of disadvantages overlap one upon the other. Uh, so the occupationally disadvantaged uh, can also be socially disadvantaged, can also be, and is quite likely to be a disadvantage in terms of ha ha habitation and habitat. And when all of these pile together, they, uh, they, uh, they lead, lead to even greater uh, uh, vulnerability, disadvantage, or let us use uh, the much clearer term, uh, disposition and, and, and oppression. And I think that it is uh, from the perspective of all of these people of disadvantage uh, that our conversation today uh, uh, will make the greatest sense. Uh, when we were planning this session, uh, Vikram uh, Patel in particular uh, said, let us be forward looking. And by all means, uh, let us think for the future. Whatever has happened, where do we go from here? And, and, and that will be really the focus of, of our discussion. But I think that briefly, just one round of discussion, uh, one round of observations from all of you on whether a stringent lockdown in principle as an idea and in the way it was executed. The execution was hugely faulty, but was the idea itself correct? Uh, was it the only or the best public health option in order to fight the pandemic? In a country where vast populations have no assured income, uh, no food without work, do not live in conditions where social distancing and intense sanitation are possible. And if, if not, what, what could we have done? Uh, differently. Uh, as I said, this will be just one round of looking at where we have reached so far and from hence and the rest of the discussion will be forward looking. Um, this format of Zoom is a little complicated about, you know, we're not exactly sitting around the table and so you don't know who's, who's wanting to speak. So one way is to just, since everybody's videos are on, is to put up your hand. But I think this first round, I, I, I'll just go uh, in the same sequence, more or less, as Natasha introduced uh, you all. And maybe uh, you could uh, it, it, give your response to this first question, uh, and, and then we could uh, go on to our other questions. So, Vikram, maybe you could start with you. So thanks, Harsh, and thank you. What a great uh, uh, opportunity to be with so many friends, uh, uh, old friends, and hopefully some new ones as well that I'm making on this webinar. Thank you for inviting me. H Harsh, I think it's first of all important to understand what is the purpose, what is the objective of a lockdown? It's quite simply to enforce physical distancing to slow the spread of the epidemic. It's very important that this is absolutely understood. The lockdown achieves nothing else. It, it does not achieve the elimination of the virus and it does not achieve the eradication of the epidemic. It doesn't do any of those. And I think this is a basic fundamental fact that we have to actually start with. 
And so then the next question is, are there other ways in which we could have slowed the epidemic and done physical distancing that are equitable and practical in our context? That really, to me, is the fundamental question. Uh, and I think there are many ways. Obviously, it, the, the horse has bolted. Uh, the train has left the station in some respects. I mean, it's now easy to look back in hindsight as what we could have done. And that's why I feel that we should be forward looking. But since you've asked this question, if I was in charge, I would have done things in a very different way. First and foremost, I would have planned the lockdown. I would have given the country enough time to plan for what is going to happen. I would have allowed public transportation to continue so that people could actually get home. My 86-year-old father is trapped alone in his apartment in Bombay. Uh, there is no way I can get him to come to live with me or for me to go live with him. I think this is simply cruel. And of course, this is my class of society. I can't even begin to imagine how harrowing it is for people uh, who are living on the breadline. The second thing I would have done is that I would have done it in a staggered way. I would have definitely used some form of uh, physical distancing or lockdown policies in those areas where there were clusters of high transmission. That is a very good epidemic management policy, but I would not have imposed a total lockdown on 1.3 billion people. Um, I don't think there was any reason to do it when it was done then. I think I would, uh, there was certainly reason to do planned and staggered uh, uh, physical distancing. The third thing I would have done is I would have implemented right at the outset a very clearly defined proper strategy for case identification. And Harsh here again, I think another issue that we should really consider is the heavy focus on top heavy medicine and technology here. You know, it's all about PCR diagnostics and intensive care. But actually, India's greatest public health success, and I, I speak amongst people like Sujata and Keshav, and they can speak for themselves here. I was just finishing. I was just saying that I wish our communication had been a little bit more, more, more balanced, that it would have really invoked our solidarity with one another rather than to invoke our fear of one another. And I think uh, it's the fear element which I feel was, was, was misplaced. We should have really invoked the support element. Keshav, over to you. Everything becomes this is absolutely correct. Lockdown was clearly not thought through. Uh, we will talk more about uh, this whole business of people thrown out of work and trying to get home. Clearly, those were aspects that no one thought about. But I think we should also remember that at the time when lockdown was announced, which was 24th, 25th March, uh, when I frankly, I don't think anybody in government had any information. And it seemed to, at that point of time, it probably seemed to them that that was the, the best they could do to control the spread of the epidemic. Uh, not knowing, not having enough information uh, and uh, really not knowing what else to do. Uh, I think we have to admit that one way or the other, lockdown has in many parts of India control the spread of the infection. Unfortunately, we squandered the time we saved. We did not use the time we gained in either strengthening government hospitals or in increasing the pace of testing or in more carefully identifying which areas were more susceptible, what Vikram was talking about, the, the clusters. Chennai, where I live, there are contradictory messages coming out all the time. The, Many, many relaxations have been introduced, but we have a very large number of uh, what they call areas of containment, red zones even now. And no one really seems to know what the correct thing to do is. So I, so the limited point I wanted to make was, uh, and I think Vikram did not really get to, what else could they have done around 24th, 25th of March? when they didn't know too much other than the fact that the infection had entered the country. I think it may be useful to spend some time looking at that. Thank you. Yeah, right. Thanks so much, uh, uh, Sujata. May, may, may you come in now, please? Thanks, uh, um, Harsh, for inviting me. Um, you know, there's not much that we can differ with what Vikram and Keshav have said. It was totally in planned. I think that's an accepted uh, uh, fact of the matter. Uh, but, you know, even if it was uh, uh, ill-planned, lockdown, once they announced it, they should have gone uh, the full hog and done the entire strategy properly. 
which meant really that uh, that was a time given to them to expand access to testing, to isolating those who are infected, uh, quarantining them, and doing a massive information campaign of do's and don'ts and what, and uh, you know, uh, de generating community uh, understanding of what we are in for. None of these things were done. And we wasted so much time in trying to just go on and on putting up ventilators and ICUs and so on, which is the uh, last bit of the whole uh, uh, epidemic. And even today, if you see Bombay, which is in such a mess, the most of the time is going and putting out these open air quarantines in that Mahalakshmi and so on. Not, not uh, understanding that on 7th June, you have the rains coming in. And then what happens to all these temporary facilities? So I think there is a, and, uh, and what has really appalled me is the way the Ministry of Health has been sidelined, uh, the way the uh, technocrats of ICMR took over, the way they constituted committees with no epidemiologists uh, in, uh, involved. I mean, there were one or two from NIE and so on, but then the chair is the DG ICMR. <clears throat> so you can, you cannot really expect uh, Ganga Ketkar and all to come up with anything different. And you know, we have enough experience in this country and, ma and a large number of epidemiologists who have been directly involved with both the HIV and the polio uh, programs. And uh, HIV in particular, I mean, as I keep watching this whole epidemic evolve, every moment I could see what's going to happen next only because of my engagement with HIV, it just has so many lessons to teach. All that memory, all that knowledge is available and it was not used. And that's a very big tragedy, I feel. Now, I really don't know what has happened in Delhi that they just simply sidelined all this and uh, went on to, you know, AIMS clinicians taking over the entire uh, program and uh, set aside public health uh, specialists. So that's something that I've been very disturbed about because we've made one mistake after another. Uh, unplanned. Now, even the exit, of course, we'll come to that later on, I suppose. Uh, but the way we are trying to also continue with the lockdown uh, seems so lacking in strategy. <laughs> My last point I'd like to make at this, uh, at this stage is I was, I'm amazed that there is no uniform guidelines for, say, testing strategies. Uh, so every, every state does its own bit. Uh, Kerala did uh, one set of uh, actions, which they proved to be very efficacious. Telangana has no strategy at all. So it's the chief minister who decides. There's no information available to anyone. So he decides that today symptomatics may be tested, next day symptomatics may be tested. So one doesn't know what's going on. There's no testing strategy in uh, Bombay, as you're seeing from the media. Every day, a uh, commissioner comes up with his own understanding of what kind of testing strategies to, fall, to follow. So the whole uh, issue of testing itself is a mess even today after so many days. That I find uh, very, very strange, not to talk of the fact that we still don't have adequate kits. And you know, I remember in, in March, mid-March itself, when, uh, when I used to be called to the TV and so on, I, we were all shouting, testing has to increase. If you remember, there was a time when we were doing five tests per million. And it was, it was so evidently ridiculous and it took so long, almost over 10 days or 10, 15 days uh, for ICMR to get out of its denial and expand the testing strategy. They kept on saying that their strategy was the best and that we should stick to travel uh, history and those related to those having had travel history. The second is they still continue to deny community transmission where there's so much evidence available that there is a community transmission on and we still don't have our strategies on how to deal with a uh, community transmission uh, led uh, epidemic. So I think, you know, the, this uh, continued confusion at the top uh, is something that's very disturbing and extremely worrying uh, as far as I can see the way the epidemic is going. We are making far too many mistakes and uh, it's going to have a lot of implications for us not to talk of the social cost, the economic cost of the lockdown and so on, that we will come to later. We know it, it's evident. But just the technical aspect of being able to contain the epidemic. And lastly, I'd like to point out that as Vikram said, lockdown has a specific purpose of uh, slowing the epidemic, uh, containing it within a 
manageable boundary and all and so on but it really hasn't uh, uh, bent the curve as they keep on saying uh, it has slowed down for sure but the ro is still very uh, high we haven't really achieved much of a success anywhere except kerala and so i think uh there is you know lockdown in my opinion when we uh, review it later seems to have been a failure we have paid too much of a social cost for not much that much of a gain uh, but uh, having said that uh, i still do believe that maybe the lockdown if planned well after a week from april 1st with everything planned properly would have had its dividends for sure uh, and a much better outcome than what we have today thank you so much uh, uh, sujatha i think that was also very comprehensive uh, for the remaining panelists uh, on this first point i you know what could we have done differently uh, suppose you were uh, uh, the minister health and uh, and what would you have uh, done differently uh, is something that we could also focus on so vandana next thanks harsh for inviting me and i mean uh, just a small disclaimer i am no longer joint convener of jan swasthya abhiyan but i work very closely with jan swasthya abhiyan also the right to food campaign i also want to mention the medical support group that's been really working uh, you know crazily really so hard to um, uh, be able to facilitate um, healthcare to people living in slums in various cities and even in rural areas so i just want to do want to mention that you know i think we are a we are a um, uh, panel of uh, fairly uh, like minded persons and we are going to mostly agree with each other and uh, hold to each other's views uh, i think vikram has already highlighted what he might have done differently quite well i mean it's a case of bringing granularity it's a case of timing timing is critical um, and just, just, just one second friends yes. uh, can i just request uh, everyone to unmute uh, to mute uh, when when we are not speaking because it makes it easier yeah, yeah. the organizers can also help with uh, some of that yeah uh, shirin if you could uh, kindly mute the other speakers sure sure but one thing one point that i do want to make harsh is that you know it's not just from the equity uh, ethics humanitarian livelihoods point of view what uh, we have actually done um, is is bad public health and i think that it's critical to be able to frame it in that way at least by public health experts it's bad public health to not think of uh, social determinants to not think of equity uh, to not think of medical conditions that are not necessarily uh, you know directly uh, uh, related to an infection by the covid virus but uh, uh, very certainly related uh, uh, causing morbidities and mortalities because of the a uh, response that we have created so i think that uh, we must very surely keep this within the public health domain and not um, be tempted into thinking of these things as collateral damage and so on i mean just in terms of data alone many people have now are now making the same points in in mainstream editorial uh, editorials vikram has you know brought out a paper we ourselves are trying to publish one it's uh, we are placing data on uh, on covid-19 deaths practically by the hour where is the data on uh heart attacks uh, you know that have not received and we are seeing this i'm seeing this on a daily basis thanks to this support group that i'm associated with the the maternal mortalities and so on and so forth which only the media is picking up on and activist groups and uh, the government should be you know um uh, totally held accountable to uh, letting uh, us know about all that as well and taking that into account in fact i mean that should not have happened in the first place but now that these things are happening um you must uh, uh, moderate your response keeping all this evidence and this data in mind the distress deaths are part of that hunger is part of public health i mean uh, lack of food is part of public health so i mean that's one central point that i wanted to make um i i feel that you know this um uh this is this grand gesture uh uh you know with with very little thinking through is very very symptomatic of this current government we've seen it before with less uh, dramatic you know outcomes and impact but we it's just really the same thing lack of planning i think that one point that was made is very uh, important to understand that we've we've transposed a public health problem into a policing problem into a law and order problem and i think that that is very very uh, important to a understand and to fight to resist uh, because really uh, there's no way that this uh, uh, this uh, uh, pandemic can be sorted out in that particular manner i also want to say that 
it's not that there is no decentralization. It's a wrong kind of decentralization. It's a classic case of decentralization without building capacities and providing support. So somebody did mention that there's no devolution of finances uh, to the state governments. That's very, very important. Secondly, as uh, Vikram also pointed out, that uh, the state leaders and even the RWS, I mean, what they have done is actually increase the stringency of the lockdown. Every, I mean, in, in Uttar Pradesh, they've increased the stringency of the lockdown. RWS have gone a step further to do even what central government is not recommending simply because they do not understand the objectives of the lockdown and nobody is bothered to, you know, make sure that they understand that. So when we say we must decentralize like Kerala, but, you know, Kerala has a long history of decentralized governance that works well because of the capacities it has. So uh, I think we need proper decentralization. Let us learn some lessons from this whole thing. This thing is not going to go away soon. We're going to be seeing a whole lot of, I think, mortality creeping up. I'm going to stop, uh, maybe come back later at some point. But I also want to just place one, you know, paradox or something that I'm struggling to understand, which is why Britain, why the UK has uh, suffered the way it has. Uh, I think it's worth analyzing. They have a very strong public health system. They also have very strong uh, social systems. I've been, you know, a part of that in some sense. Um, and they have, you know, a community that is not as... Uh, variegated as our own, and yet uh, look at the mortalities there. Is it something to do with demographics or whatever? But it's a, it's an, it's a, you know something to think about. Um, I also feel that we 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 must not underestimate the the uh, you know the nature of this pandemic, and we we cannot also play it down. It is a very in the best of circumstances, we are in a very very difficult situation in the world and in this country in particular. I'll just stop there for now. Thanks so much, Vandana. Uh, I think. Uh, 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 Sundar, could you come in uh, with, with your observations about uh, what, how you assess what has happened so far? Sundar, you'll have to unmute. Yeah. yeah. I think most of it has said, and Madhra has just made the point about policing versus public health, and I think that's a very, very central issue, and I've, I've not got too much to add. Let me just uh, make one, uh, just an observation. Suppose we had allowed all the migrants who wanted to go to go back home the day, the week before the lockdown. On March 14th, we had 100 cases, even if we say 1,000 cases. The spread would have been of 100 cases. Now, when you have locked them in, you have actually incubated the whole infection within those quarantine centers, which one has no sense of quarantine in them. And now you are letting out 60,000 people we are actually going to have. Just think of it. If we had actually let them go, the disease, the stage of the spread it was. So somewhere the ethical principle that people have a right to return to their family. The more you frighten them that you may die, there is an epidemic, the more you want to get back to your family. Between the basic understanding of ethics and between a basic value and rights and public health, that actually makes a lot of connection. We sort of miss that. The other surprising paradoxes, I just want to draw your attention to two paradoxes. One is we have a system we built it up after the swine flu, but we had started it before, the Integrated Disease Surveillance Program. You know what happened to it? Its last report goes up on the February first week. It has been reporting weekly from 2010. In the last report, it faithfully and brilliantly reports the first three COVID cases of India and then goes silent. No further reports are put up no further information and i believe it's not just not put up it's not even on flow so you have built a system at some effort particularly for managing epidemics and when the epidemic coming the first thing you do is let go of it and similar thing we do with the public hospitals you have top line public hospitals which actually provide a huge amount of care which are willing to run despite because they have the notion of public services where many other hospitals shut down. But what do you do? You actually empty them out and keep the beds empty in anticipation of an epidemic that should arise. So when we say we created one lakh additional beds, we've only repurposed existing beds and reduced the total amount of care available within the public sector in effective terms. Because unlike the other places where new hospitals came overnight, over here what you actually did was repurpose essential. So you use it for residual care. 
before you were you had a minimal package now you say okay covid 19 nobody will handle i'll handle this but what i am handling now let somebody else take care of so our the point i am making is this the health system preparedness for which the country sacrificed so much the migrants are satisfied families have been present it actually not only did not happen it took a bizarre turn at least on these two areas one is the disease surveillance program it's been disrupted by the epidemic instead of actually being built up by it. and the second is on the whole area of the public care that was there so this whole repurposing of central public hospitals without any substitute arrangement has been actually not the way that health systems preparedness was conceived these are serious issues and i'll stop with this the rest actually i endorse they have already said some of those issues thanks so much sundar uh, and and finally vikas uh, do you have anything to add i think the next question i'll go the reverse so that you know because i think a lot has been said so i'll we will go in reverse direction so that you all have more to say on the second question and so on but because do you, is there anything that you want to add to what has already been said yes i uh, wish to add just a little bit uh, many thanks for having me on this discussion see uh, among i mean beyond just being appallingly planned i think uh, the way and manner of imposition of lockdown was very very criminal you see none of the consequences which followed they were not unforeseeable we we had all the information about the conditions of living of our people about the size of informal sector workforce and all and unmindful of all those things the lockdown was implemented so i think uh, it had a very pronounced class bias in the manner it was carried through secondly one lasting impact of that lockdown had has been that it has confounded our strategies to combat this pandemic by portraying the uh, it's probably uh, the worst victims of this uh, pandemic as the criminals or as the most dangerous ones remember how police treated uh, these migrant workers the lati charges and all those kind of things then we had uh um, minorities getting targeted and all that so uh, and and this is all carried on the way in decisions uh, as recently as that one state government deciding we will not let these migrant workers go so it, this all of this you know it it ultimately fits into this jigsaw uh, puzzle lockdown has not just been carried out badly but it has confounded our our strategies it has confounded what needs to be done and all and i think uh, the result is that those who ought to have been treated as victims of the pandemic are now being criminalized lest they fall sick or something you know we have reduced human beings to be treated as vectors of the disease and it was very very evidently visible i think this is something uh, it's not just that you know okay it was done it was done it was a mistake and all it 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 wasn't really that way and this thinking continues to cast a shadow on what the government is doing as of today this is what my submission is friends uh, it was a absolutely wonderful conversation Uh, I really wish uh, our policy makers uh, find the time to listen to uh, people like you, uh, and uh, and I think that I, for one, learned a great deal uh, about you know uh, what needs to be done. And I think that it calls for our best strengths in these final words. You spoke about perseverance. You spoke about reliance on communities, reliance on states, uh, uh, on hope. uh on on kindness and i think above all on solidarity uh, uh that we are all on, in, in all of, in all of this uh, we are there together uh and 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 the suffering of uh you know uh, the suffering of that last person should be uh, suffering that i i uh, uh i i i i i i would rage against Uh, and fight against uh, and i think that let's uh, let's uh, let's continue to to have these conversations and continue to strive uh, as uh, as we pass through this 
clarifying and defining time in our lives. So thank you all of you once again.